Good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me properly and you can see the uh, webinar presentation on screen. My name is Brian Donovan. I'm the Irish records expert at Find My Past, uh, based in Dublin. Um, you'll see to your left-hand side there's a, a Q&A screen. You can ask questions at any time you like during the presentation and I will try and answer a few of them towards the end of the presentation as well. Um, now, to get stuck into this, uh, I like to always start any presentation about Irish uh, family history with one key image that we need to keep in mind. Uh, in front of you at the moment, you'll see a picture of what the Irish Public Record Office looked like in that fateful day in June 1922 when it was blown to smithereens at the opening stages of the Irish Civil War. When that took place, uh, most of our 19th century census records were destroyed. 50% of our Church of Ireland parish records were destroyed and virtually all of the state administrative records prior to 1700 were, were uh, consumed in flames. Um, and it can leave you with uh, a very serious question. Is Irish research possible? Well, we tend to focus a little bit too much in Irish genealogy about how difficult Irish research is. Uh, but I'm here to tell you a little bit about what's positive about Irish genealogy. And I think sometimes what tends to get overlooked uh, by a lot of people when they're actually trying to actually unscramble or even find any information at all about their obscure Irish ancestry. There is an Irish opportunity. There are record sets in Ireland which just don't exist in the same level or same dimension or volume as anywhere else else. And this simply is the nature of the relationship between Ireland and its nearest neighbour, Britain. And because of that, uh, the government of Ireland was obsessed with two things. It was obsessed with the Irish land, who owned it, who controlled it, who lived in it, and where they were, and as a consequence of which we have records about land occupation unlike anything that exists or survives for Britain. They were also even more concerned about security. Ireland was the back door to, to Britain. Uh, he who controlled Ireland would probably more likely control uh, Britain. Certainly that was the official doctrine. And as a consequence of which, there was a huge concern about making sure that Ireland was safe from foreign intrigues. And of course, added to this was the fact that a large part of the Irish population weren't too keen on the fact that they had actually been taken over by another country. So there was rebellions on a very regular basis. So we have a lot of police records, army records, court records, criminal records, a huge amount of information, far more than you would find uh, surviving for England, or Scotland for that matter. So these are real opportunities, which we tend to forget that we have more in Ireland than you do sometimes elsewhere. So today I want to talk about uh, the records of the basically the court system and the prison system. And this is a brief overview of the, the structure for today's uh, talk. I want to discuss the origins, what, what, what the origins are of these institutions, how they changed under the Enlightenment, and what the court system looked like and what the records are like, and the same with the prison system. And then hopefully we can have some questions. If you have anything further to question then, please do add it in. Let's start with a few definitions because one of the difficulties of history is, is that it isn't, um, it's like people often refer to it as a different country, um, because what we think of as the meanings for words that we use today are not necessarily what they were in the past, nor do they tell us very much about the origins of those words. So what is a court? Well, a court goes way back to the medieval period, and it originally was the king's council, the immediate group of people who had around him, men in the main, uh, who actually advised and made decisions uh, to run a country. This was divided over a period of time because the workload got so much into the, what we call the four courts, the courts of Chancery, Exchequer, Common Pleas, and King's Bench. And they were the, all the four courts which were in the same building we saw earlier on that was blown to pieces. Here's a picture from your top right-hand corner of your screen of what the four courts looks like today in its restored state in Dublin. But there were four courts in London uh, and uh, Edinburgh and elsewhere. Uh, but these were the four central courts. But they broke out into a local level. And at a local level, the courts, like the central courts, were all about maintenance of power. Just like those four courts in Dublin were about maintaining the king's or the lord's uh, power over the country, the courts at a local level were about maintaining the power of landlords, barons, and so on over their own jurisdiction. And the courts at a local level were run by justices of the peace. Now, these were established in the 
13th century. That's how old our legal system goes, because even if you're listening from uh, the US or from Canada or Australia, as with Ireland or Britain, we all run on the common law system at the fundamental basis of our legal structure goes back to uh, medieval times uh, and the system of the JPs. And these justices of the peace looked after the quarter sessions and the petty sessions. You can tell the age of these things just by the names. Session, session is a French word. Petit session. Um, anyway, that's the, that's the deep history lesson. But on prisons, it's equally important to understand what their origin is. Just like courts are all about power and maintaining power for an elite, prisons are not necessarily what you might think. We have a vision of prisons as being these austere, horrible institutions which you didn't want to ever go to. Well, that's true, but what existed before that? Well, for most of our history, right up until the 19th century, um, in most cases, somebody convicted of a crime, if it was a lesser crime, was stuck in stocks, as you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen, um, for a period of time. Uh, if you were lucky, for a more serious crime, you might be transported, uh, mostly to Australia, but sometimes in the earlier years to the Americas. Um, but mostly, if you were convicted of, of a crime, a felony, even larceny, you were hung. Uh, prisons only came about because of a major change in the way people thought about the world. And that's what we'd call now the Enlightenment in the 18th century. And, and in simple terms, this is about uh, an understanding that hum human condition wasn't preordained, that in fact it could be reformed. So just because you were guilty of theft, it didn't mean that you were just a fundamentally bad person and you should just be hung. You might actually be able to be reformed, to become a productive member of society. And to do that, you'd need to have prisons. So this is the, the, the key aspect of that. And one, what's so important in understanding that is by knowing that prisons were set up to reform people, it meant that they had to gather an awful lot of information about people in the prisons. So they had to have records. And that's why we have prison records. The only people before the prison, these prison systems started in, in the 1790s and later who were kept for long durations of time were people who owed money, debtors' prisons. And you were kept in prison until your family or friends paid your debts. Um, otherwise, you were only ever kept in a prison uh, awaiting trial or awaiting sentence. There were no penitential prisons which, which kept people to reform them. Now, we can thank a, a great Englishman, uh, Jeremy Bentham, who's a radical from the late 18th century, for, for us actually having prisons. Um, because he believed, he was a fervent uh, believer in, in the fundamental good quality of the human spirit and the fact that it could be reformed. He also had other radical ideas. He believed that uh, all adult males should have the right to vote, and more radically, he believed that all adult women should have the right to vote. It took another 120 years for that to come about. But so he was very much ahead of his time. So I want you to think of prisons as being these, these radically progressive institutions for their day. And when he designed prisons, there's an example here of the, the layout of what was called a panopticon, uh, and that was the, the model used for uh, Kilmainham uh, Prison in, in, in Dublin, which was built in 1796 in Richmond and Grange Gorman and Mountjoy afterwards. But as you can see, it's laid out like a fan, and it means that the prison warders can stand or sit in the middle and have a constant view of everybody inside the prison and make sure that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing and actually becoming better people. So, what about the, the, the court system? We looked at prisons and its origins. A little bit more about the court system. Well, by the 19th century, there were uh, only 17 judges in those central Dublin courts, Chancery, Exchequer, King's Bench, and Common Pleas. But there were 115 judges in inferior courts, uh, Petty Sessions Courts, Court of Sessions Courts, scattered all over the country. Uh, and we have a image, three images here which I think are quite interesting. On your top right-hand corner is a cartoon from Punch magazine, which is a, a, a satirical magazine in London, about what an Irish court looked like. And you can see everybody squabbling. And, and of course, it's, it's got all the usual sort of like uh, anti-Irish bigotry. You'll find an awful lot of cartoons at the time. But there is a little truth in that, in the fact that over 50% of the cases in Irish courts were civil cases, disputes between neighbours. Uh, and it's important to understand because the Irish are the second most litigious people in the world today, and they were certainly one of the most litigious in the 19th century. The most litigious people in the world today, if you didn't realize already, are those are uh, from the US. Uh, but the Irish come second on the world scales. You've also got two images of, of courts, and the one on the left is a... Um, is the courthouse in Gorey in County Wexford, where I come from. And the very bottom is an old courthouse in Ballyvaughan in, in Claret. Now, I, I do put those two examples in front of you to give you an idea that court
Pirates weren't necessarily grand buildings. Um, the little one down in Ballyvaughan was, was just a, a thatch house, thatch cottage. At the top of the local uh, court system was the Assize Court. That was the most important local court. Uh, and that was there to deal with all the most serious offences at a local level. Treason, murder, treason, um, rape, perjury, assault with intent to murder, and so on. Um, insurrection being a big one. Now these were presided over uh, by the judges of the central uh, courts in Dublin and they went on progress um, every year and they toured around the provinces and they held these courts. So people could be held in prison for quite a long time to actually before they went to trial for these major offences. Unfortunately the records of the Assize courts in the main don't survive. But the good news is that if there ever was a court to be presided over at any local level, it was well covered by the local press because these were the big crimes. And you'll be pleased to hear that most um, of the 19th century newspapers are being digitized and indexed and placed at Find My Past. So you can go and have a look and see what the press had to say about those court cases that happened. But I'm actually more interested in the, the courts further down the scale, the ones that dealt with the more, the less serious crimes. And the big courts were the court of sessions, which were held at a county level. Um, they were presided over by two or more JPs, just as the piece. We'll find out more about them in a minute. And then also the assistant barrister's court, which dealt with civil cases at a local level. So court of sessions was criminal or statutory cases, and the assistant barristers were civil cases. And they dealt with an enormous amount of cases every year. Um, the tragedy is, of course, these records, and you'll see I've got question marks beside them. These records, we mostly don't survive. I do think there's some that do haven't been found yet, still up in the, the attics of old courthouses and so on. There's quite a lot of work still needs to be done in Ireland to try and recover what we've lost. Now all of these courts, these court sessions, the size courts and assistant barristers courts were all amalgamated in 1923 uh, into the circuit court after Irish independence. So they're all performed by those judges now. Here's an example of a, uh, of a quarter sessions courthouse in Castle Bar in County Mayo. And you'll see that there's, there's three judges at the top of the bench, there's two JPs and an assistant barrister. Now the assistant barrister is important because JPs were local landlords who had the right to hear cases. An assistant barrister was a trained legal uh, professional and their job was to make sure that the law was adhered to in decisions. You'll also notice that on the left hand side there's a jury of, of 12 peers and then there's the, the assembled uh, watching in on the case plus all the various different officials and clerks and so on. Um, we've got another example here of a courthouse. This is Monaghan Courthouse which still stands and is used today. So some of these, of these, these are the grander courthouses that exist. Further down um, the seriousness were the Petty Sessions Courts. These were cases which were not serious enough to go to the, the county courts, the, the, the quarter sessions. And these records do survive, and this is why I'm going to be focusing my talk on courts about. Now these were originally set up going way back to the medieval period, like I said before, but there was no set of statute law governing how they should be run until 1827. So for hundreds and hundreds of years they just ran as an informal system. And they were presided over by the local landlord, by the Justice of the Peace. And they did this as their civic duty, so they weren't paid for, for presiding over these cases. They didn't have to have a legal training either. And this was a real problem. I mean, even the government of the day realized that the system was open to extraordinary abuse. So they passed this act in 1827 to try and regularize the system and try and bring in paid magistrates, the men known as the resident magistrates. So what were these resident magistrates like? Well, you see some pictures here, uh, and if some of you remember uh, the series on BBC television and uh, Irish RTE television back in the 1980s, we'll remember some of these images. That's Flurry Knox and, and, and Major Bowles from the Irish RM, which was a series on television. And it was written and based on books written by two ladies in a picture on your right, um, Somerville and Ross, who were two wonderful characters who were writing at the very beginning of the 20th century. They lived down in West Cork, Castle Townsend, uh, and uh, their graves are below uh, them. They were, they were lifelong friends. Uh, but they wrote these wonderful series of books about Irish country life, and they set all of their court cases in, all of their stories, in a courtroom. And the reason they did that is because, of course, they knew that the Irish were deeply litigious. They loved going to court, uh, loved having their day in court, and it was a great environment in which to actually try and get under the skin of, of, of Irish character and Irish social life. Um, so 
we should take a, uh, a leaf out of their book and have a look at these cases and see what they tell us about our ancestors. Now here is a pen and ink sketch of a Petty Sessions court in, in uh, session. And you'll see on the right hand side you have a big bench uh, with a, 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 a man who's probably the Justice of the Peace or the Resident Magistrate, I'm not sure which. Um, on the left hand side you'll see another man sitting down beside a much smaller bench and he was the recorder and he was filling in the, the uh, registers of each of the court cases. These are the documents that we've digitized and indexed and put online. Other than that there's a couple of policemen you'll see there in the background and it's just the local community is, is in to have their cases. Obviously the police would have brought a few people to trial uh, for minor offences and otherwise it's civil cases. You also notice that in fact the event is happening in a big house. Um, it's probably the, the, the JP's own house as a local landlord. Um, now let's go and have a look and see a little bit more about this. The Petty Sessions registers or courts were established, as I said, by statute in 1827. Um, and they established boundaries, because originally there had been sort of rather an informal system of boundaries uh, of what, where their jurisdiction lay. But the 1827 Act specified that the boundaries should be set, and they also specified that records should be kept properly. So from 1827 or 1828, we have our first registers survived to this day. Um, you can see here an example of a decision taken at, um, uh, at a county uh, jurisdictional level to set out the districts in County Kilkenny of the Petty Sessions District. And there are about uh, 14 districts in, in Kilkenny, um, that one county. They said a new statute came in in 1851 which made record keeping not only required but mandatory and they had to actually keep records in a particular printed format. So the overwhelming majority of our surviving records date from 1851 onwards, but we still have a significant amount from earlier as well. As I said, it's criminal and civil law. There are 20 million cases that survive up until independence in 1922 and they deal with 33 million people's names. Now to put that in context, there are only 14 million uh, birth, marriage and death records up to the same era. So there's more court cases than there are birth, marriage, death records. Uh, we've put 22 million records uh, online so far because we have to follow the 100 year rule. We'll have the rest of the records up over the coming years as uh, we're allowed to release them. Um, but they're all done waiting to be released. Um, so let's see what they have to tell us. Oh, actually, before we do that, I want to do something which is even more interesting. I want to tell you about the types of offences that happened at these cases. Because this tells you a huge amount of the differences in different character between Ireland and England at the same time. Um, I think it's really important to understand these distinctions when you actually look at the records. You understand uh, the types of crimes in their historic context. This is a document drawn up in 18. 64, and it's quite extraordinary because what they do is they try and compare crime figures in Ireland and crime figures in England and Wales and they readjust England and Wales populations so it would be the same as Ireland. So the numbers are supposed to be comparable. So if you run down through this, the more serious crimes are at the top. You'll notice one of the first things which is interesting is that the number of aggravated assaults on women and children is far higher in England and Wales than it is in Ireland. Further on, stealing twice as, uh, as prevalent in England and, and Wales as it is in Ireland. And that's about the, the end of, of uh, the crime rates being higher in England and Wales. Um, willful and malicious destruction of property, almost two to one uh, in Ireland, twice as many cases in Ireland. There are a number of reasons for that and we'll talk about them a little bit later. You go on, common assaults, again, almost twice as many cases happening in Ireland as there are in England. And as you go down, you'll, you'll notice under uh, the Fisheries Act, uh, the, the Irish are, are uh, extraordinary poachers of fish, um, uh, whereas the English are much bigger in poaching game. Uh, further down, workhouse uh, offences are much more likely to be committed in England than they are in Ireland. Prostitution is far higher in Ireland than it is in England. That shouldn't be surprising. Ireland, particularly at this time frame, was a known um, uh, destination uh, for sex tourism, particularly in Dublin, amongst the uh, uh, the, the uh, the wealthier elite of Europe. Um, places like uh, the Monto in Dublin were renowned. As you go further down, you'll see that begging and other offences again more common in England than they are in Ireland. But the really big numbers here is that, uh, are, are the following. The Irish were three times more likely to evade paying tax. Nothing much has changed there. 
Um, they were three times more likely to be done for drunken disorderly behaviour than their counterparts in England and Wales. Again, some would argue that nothing has really changed very much there. But the, you know, joking aside, the really, really big difference between the two is the very bottom figure. There are twice as many Irish people going through the court system than English people. And there's a reason for that. Ireland was a much, much less um, stable country than England. It was far more likely to be engaged in a great deal of seditious activity. But more importantly, uh, the, the number of courthouses and the number of police in Ireland were almost fourfold the number that existed in England. So in fact, actually, Ireland was at this time, it wouldn't be incorrect to describe it as a security state. Um, so when you understand that, you get a bit of sense of just how, why there's so many records, not just the civil cases I mentioned before, but also in terms of, of uh, court records for uh, criminal cases. Now I'm going to show you an example of one of these Petty Sessions court records, because they're wonderfully illuminating, and they aren't necessarily quite what you might think. Uh, and the example I have at the top of the page here is a case from 1898, and it's Joanna Maher of Templemore in County Tipperary, brings, her, uh, brings a family member, Patrick Moore, um, and it goes on to say that on the 14th of August 1898, at Templemore in Tipperary, Patrick did threaten the life of Joanna, having previously accused her of witchcraft. And it goes on to say that Patrick is a dangerous lunatic. Well, we might just think that's a dispute between two family members that didn't go anywhere. Well, the truth of the matter is that Patrick was carted off to the local district lunatic, as you'll see in the very last column there. And under that legislation that existed in Ireland actually up until the late 1950s, any family member could bring another family member to court, and if the judge permitted, they could be sent to a lunatic asylum um, uh, for a minimum of one month. The room for abuse of that system was enormous, and that's a whole other lecture of its own I'll come back to maybe someday. Here's another example of a Petty Sessions court register. This is from my hometown, Ferns in County Wexford. Um, you'll see people are being uh, brought to court for road nuisances, disorderly behaviour, having an unlicensed dog, I'll come back to the dogs in a minute, uh, assault. It's all the sort of minor affrays and minor issues at a local level. Uh, and you get the names of the complainants, who are usually, the, the, in this case, they're nearly all uh, police constables, uh, and those who are defendants and the judges and so on. Here's another example, also from Wexford, um, of four cases of parents being brought to court for not vaccinating their children. And this is in 1872. So it's extraordinary the types of things that people are being brought to court for. So you get the names of the parents, the name of the child in that record. So now, the dogs. I mentioned them before. The court system was supposed to pay for itself. Um, no tax money was going to be spent on this. Uh, and they did so by granting licenses. And one of the biggest licenses they granted were dog licenses. Every farmer had a dog, and every dog had to have a license. These are wonderfully useful because they've got over 6 million names of farmers paying for the dog license. And in a country where we don't actually have census records surviving, and we have so many other things missing, this is a wonderful snapshot of the district in the country. So if you can have a look and see what these things look like. I'll give you one example which is really relevant. This is the dog license book for a foe in County Donegal. Now, if you've ever done research in County Donegal, you'll know that the record survival rate there is rubbish. And you'll see why, if you look at that image. There's mold spores all over that page, up on the right -hand, top right-hand corner. It's rotting. And that's because Donegal has got appalling climate from a paper point of view. It's damp. Um, there, there's, um, it's, it's very, very difficult for paper to survive in that environment. So, but why is it so useful? Well, Rafaud's local parish registers, Catholic and, and every other denomination, don't really start until the late 1870s. Whereas this is from 1867, you've got a full list of probably pretty much all the heads of agricultural households and uh, their name, their address, and of course the fact they've had to buy a license for their dog. You can find out the, the colour and description of the dog there. Not the names here, but when you get lucky, like the next page you're going to see from Mount Rath in the middle of Ireland, um, they've got the names of the dogs too. So you can find out the name of the dog that your ancestor's family might have had. Not something you'd expect to find. Now, the courts, in many cases, particularly the, civil, the criminal cases, ended up in a prison sentence. Um, and I'd like to actually look now at the, the prison records. The prison registers that we have on Fire My Past uh, are all the surviving prison reg registers for uh, the Republic. Uh, and they date from 1790 when um, was established. So there's an interesting background to the sorts of prison records that we, we have. Um, there were there was a series of reports carried out in the early 19th century 
country starting in 1822 about the state of prisons and they discovered there were more prisons per population in Ireland than anywhere else in Europe. They found 178 prisons in operation, of which 10 were in Dublin. Most of them were what they called black holes. And these were private prisons run by city uh, corporations, landlords, and so on, where they held people for payment of debt. Um, so they had 12,000 prisoners who were in state prisons, but many, many more were in these black holes. So what they tried to do was change the system, shut down the black holes, replace them with proper police bridewells, which were temporary prisons, uh, and institute county prisons. So you can see over the course of the century, by 1882, there's only seven prisons. There's only 33 bridewells still operating, uh, and everything else is just in these county prisons. There are 35,000 prisoners and 4,000 in bridewells. Back in 1849, there were 88,000 prisoners in that one year, just in bridewells alone. Quite extraordinary. The sort of types of prisons that existed in Ireland, I think I sort of described most of them already, but they, they were, in Dublin you had a variety of big old uh, prisons which largely got shut down in the early 19th century as they tried to renovate and improve these prisons. And, and we had Kilmainham Prison being built, the Richmonds being built, and great, you know, in um, Mountjoy and so on. We also had the old debtors' prisons like the Marshalsea, the county prisons, and the which I mentioned before. Um, and the police bridewells, which have retained people until they heard a case in court. This is a picture of the interior of prison, which is probably better known for its use. Actually, it was shut down in 1910, closed down. It was reopened in 1916 to act as housing for many of those who'd been engaged in the rebellion that year. Um, there are also a series of, of uh, other prisons. This is a, a picture of the, the Richmond prison. Uh, and the Richmond itself causes problems about which Richmond prison, one Richmond prison in Dublin, uh, the, the Richmond prison you just looked at, and there's also then the Richmond Bridewell, which was the uh, on the South Circular Road, which is now today a, a college, Griffiths College. And here's some pictures of what these prisons look like. On the top left-hand corner, you have the women's prison in Grange Corman. On the bottom right-hand corner, you have a bridewell, a police bridewell in Tipperary. Uh, there's another one here of um, the county prison in Wexford. Quite grand building sometimes. When you read crime books uh, and uh, crime and society in the 19th century, you can get quite confused about how many prisoners there really were. And this is a, a list of those who were in, uh, in prison in 1852. And you probably can't see all these figures terribly well, but you'll have to believe me here to say that the grand total of prisoners in that year was 12,000 um, uh, prisoners. But you think that was the total number of prisoners? So that's what it says in this document. And it's a government document from 1853 about figures in 1852. But there's another document from the same year from, uh, which covers the, the number of prisoners for 1852. And it's got three columns here for each county. One, it says the number of uh, prisoners committed by the quarter sessions. Another column which says the number of prisoners committed by the petty sessions, and another column which says those who were just charged by the police and imprisoned. Uh, and if you go down to the, the, the totals there, you still have your... Um, the, 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 the first column is the same as the one we saw before, but there's another 59,000 people who've been sentenced through the petty session system and another 19,000 people sent or brought to prison by the police. The point I'm trying to make here is it's a total of uh, over 100,000 people behind bars in that one year. But if you read most books about uh, prisoners, they'll only ever take the ones who are in officially in penal servitude, not in all the other people who might have been in the prison for drunk and disorderly behaviour and so on. So the numbers of people going through the prison system was enormous, given the population of the country. So the main prison records, as I said, start that are in the National Archives in Ireland. They start in 1790 for Kilmainham. There's 134,000 pages in these prison registers, 2.77 million prisoners. And there's also not just prisoners mentioned in these records. Most, many of the records have details about relatives, and many of them have records about victims. And I'm going to show you some of these uh, documents, because all of these names have been indexed on our website, and, and, and all of the, the images, all of the pages have been imaged. So what do these records look like? Um, well, they, they cover all sorts of information. They give you the name of the, the, the prisoner, the address, their place of birth, occupation, religion, education, their age, a physical description, um, the name and address of next of kin, the crime committed, the sentence, and the dates of committal and release or decease. So that's quite a lot of, of data to get. It's very valuable for, for research. Um, 
And the type of, of crimes, well, about 40% of the cases are drunk and disorderly behavior, like I think I said before. The other crimes are most common are theft theft, assault, trespass, workhouse offences, begging, vagrancy, prostitution, riot, debt, and obscene language. Quite a surprising number of people were in prison for obscene language, which leads me to think that if else they were doing that wasn't so good apart from the obscene language. Uh, we've also had some interesting research carried out recently of the number of people who were put into prison for playing sports, and uh, it turns out that there was, that was quite high too. So further evidence that there needs to be of, of the sort of heavy hand of the police. Um, there's also another reason why the police system, well, the prison system was so heavily populated, particularly in the mid-19th century, and that is a famine. Um, the truth is that the prison system had one thing that being out of a prison didn't have. You got fed. An enormous number of people actually found their way into the prison system as a way of surviving the famine. So we shouldn't be surprised by the enormously high numbers of 100, 120,000 or more in the prison each year during the famine years, because it was a way of surviving. Now, these are the prisons that we have on the website. Um, it's fairly extensive, you'll see. See, I've got a simple list here by, by county and by prison and the covering dates. You'll get all this detail, and there's no need to furiously try to write it down here. Um, but it's a fairly broad coverage. Unfortunately, we don't yet have the records for Northern Ireland. We hope that we'll be able to persuade the Office of Northern Ireland to allow us to, to use them in the future. So here are some examples. Um, this one here, we're going to zoom in a little bit on the top line because this is actually from Golden in uh, 1913. And it's an example I want to give because it's, it's indicative of the type of information you're going to get. Uh, Patrick Ward is the name of the person who's uh, up there first. And we find out that he's, 100, he's, he's 46 years old. He's five foot nine and a half inches tall. He's got blue eyes, fresh complexion. He's got a couple of off tattoos on him which are all described in the marks in this person, the harp is one of them. He's a um, hundred, I can't quite see this here, but it's a hundred and, and, and thirty pounds, I seem to remember. He was born, born in Johnstown in Athlone. His weight, by the way, is important because he, he, had, he actually was relatively healthy. Um, um, but he was born in Johnstown in Athlone. His last residence was in Tume. And his wife is Mary Ward of Tuberty Road in Tume. And he's a tinsmith, so he's a traveller. Irish travellers are notoriously difficult to track to the, to the records because they avoided interaction with official them at all opportunity. But the travelling community was very large uh, in the past, uh, and uh, the surprising the number of people who are descendant from travellers. If you've ever done any traveller research, you'll realise that one of the only find any information about them at all is if they interacted with the official authorities. Um, Here's another example here. If we zoom in on this one here, I just really wanted to point out that there's a column on the right-hand side, which lists off the offences. And in there, you'll see in the middle an Ellen Mia of Kappa in County Waterford. She was assaulted by whoever was being imprisoned here. All of these names have been indexed too on, the, on, on our site. So you can find out whether somebody was a victim. Another example here is from Mountjoy Prison in Dublin. And on top line again is a Bridget Coughlin, who is 46. She's five foot one inch tall. Um, she's got a fresh complexion. She's 100 pounds. She's a slight little lady. And she was born in Clane in County Kildare. So, and she lives in the Rialto Cottages on the South Circular Road, just up the road from me. And uh, her husband is Thomas Coughlin, also of the same address. And it goes on to tell us that she was imprisoned for a month for assaulting Thomas Coughlin. So many people are in here for, for fairly minor, um, what we describe as domestic uh, cases. But the prison system was responsible for more than just simply prisons. They were responsible for certain rudimentary aspects of the, of the medical infrastructure as well. Uh, and here's an example of one, which is they, they ran the inebriate reformatory as a national institution set up towards the end of the 19th century to deal with the problem of, of, of the demon drink, uh, which we don't have a great relationship with. And the reason why I wanted to raise this is all these records are on the site too. And this double page spread you see in front of me is all related to the same person. And every record there is is a double page spread relating to every, every individual who went through the system. And they are tragic stories. In the case here, we have an Ellen Brennan. She's 32 years old. She's been 28 times previously convicted of drunken disorderly behavior. And it gives her full life history here in this paragraph. Now, to summarize, she was one of three girls born to a, a family of very poor farmers. Her father uh, disappeared when she was very small. She doesn't know he's living or dead. Um, it goes on to say that, that uh, her mother couldn't cope with the kids, so put them all into the local workhouse, which was in Swinford in County Mayo. 
And when she was in the, the workhouse, she became increasingly addicted to drink. Uh, she became very violent. Um, she was involved in many, many assaults. She was brought through the disciplinary process there. Uh, she was also responsible for smashing the windows of a local magistrate. And when she got out of the workhouse, she slipped into a life of petty criminality, prostitution. She had several children. Um, and her, her life is it's, 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 it's awfully, awful, awfully uh, heart-wrenching story. Um, but it's just played out here in full. If we go back to the image we just saw a moment ago, actually, because I think it's important to mention, on the left-hand side of the image you have in front of you, you'll see that when she leaves the, the, the reformatory, she's tracked by the prison system across the country, and there's very series of dates there and what they see been doing and how she seems to be getting on. In brief, she didn't get on terribly well, unfortunately, afterwards. So you're not just going to get the civil disputes and the crime. You'll find all sorts of odd records in, in the prison records. Now, in Ireland, we've never been terribly interested in, 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 in our ancestors' involvement in anything at all, really, unless it potentially was a rebellious activity. Then we get terribly excited. Um, I don't know what your attitude yourself might be, but that's certainly what it is in Ireland. And we have plenty of rebels in these records, too. Now, this is a rather famous page. It's a page from Kilmain and Register, and we have Robert Emmett. He's the guy with the star. He's about the third line down on the left-hand side, who led the ill-fated rising in 1803 in Dublin. Uh, and, of course, he was sentenced to death for high treason and hung, drawn, and quartered. But if you actually look further down the list, all his compatriots are there, too, all convicted of rebellion. The page is made up of loads of them, and they're all sentenced to death, one after the other. Um, but that was quite... Now, there's quite a lot more than that. Here's a more recent record um, from the Irish War of Independence when um, the uh, Offences Against the State Act was in operation during the First World War, so it meant that the uh, state could pick up anybody they wanted without charge. Uh, and we have the same prison register for all of the people who were being picked up without charge at that time too. And you get their names and their address, where they were originally born, the next of kin, and so on. So it's, it can give you wonderful insight into the, the movements of all of these people at this time and their activities and involvement in uh, sedition. But it wasn't just big rebellions like this. I think you got, need to understand that there's lots of low-level uh, rebellious activity happening all the time. And here's a really good example. This is from Limerick Prison in the 1880s. Uh, and you'll see there's a group of guys who are together imprisoned. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in on, on, on this because you can have a better look at the reason why they're all placed in prison together. Um, I don't know if you can quite read it up on your top right-hand side, but basically it said that all of these people have been imprisoned for being members of an illegal secret society with the aim of overthrowing uh, a landlord's property, basically. So they're part of the land war. They're one of the local, many, many local groups all across the country who set themselves together to go in and burn the crops of a landlord or start intimidating or otherwise and trying to actually um, continue the campaign against uh, or in favour of fair rents or even the abolition of the landlord system. So we've got many more prison records now to cover because we've, we've, we've published all of the main ones, but we keep on discovering new ones. So I'm delighted to be able to say that we're currently working on a variety of new prison records which will be coming out over the course of the next while. And these include uh, lots of exciting ones. Like, for example, we have uh, the outrage reports from the middle of the 19th century, which are at a time when there aren't that many other records, give you a huge amount of information about the goings-on at a local level. The people who file outrages with the police, they're saying awful things are happening locally, you get the names of the people where they come from, and the people they're accusing of doing awful things, and all, all, all the information around them. Um, at an earlier level, again, we're working on the Chancery and Exchequer case files, Chancery and Exchequer, as I seem to remember at the very beginning, I mentioned were part of the four courts. They're really interesting courts because they were equity courts. They were cheaper courts for people to go to. So they tended to attract um, you know, farmers uh, to actually take cases there, which they could afford to go there rather than to other courts. And you get names of the people that you'll notice on here. We've got Thomas Bulger and Catherine, his wife, in a case against uh, James Higgins uh, and, and others. And this is from 1677. So these records go right back into the early 1600s. So it's wonderfully informative. So there's a lot of excitement about these ones going to be coming out later. We're also going to be releasing, hopefully, the penal servitude records. And here's one example. Each of these records are 30, 40 page files about one in, you know, single individual. And you find out all the information you can about them, including your heights and weights. and all. But you also find out summations of the correspondence they've had during their tenure inside prison. Um, and you find out oh, uh, lots of information about uh, their, their physical characteristics, as I said, their next of kin, um, 
And the, the funnest thing about them is you get photographs of when they've arrived and when they leave prison. You notice this guy here on the left-hand side is when he arrived, and the right-hand side is when he left. And I, I suspect, and I'm not surprised by this really, that he actually looks a bit healthier when he's leaving, possibly because of the three square meals a day. Um, anyway, that's the end of the the uh, main part of my presentation. Uh, so I'd be very happy to take some questions at this point now, um, and I'm going to switch over and see what we might have to, to have a look. Ah, the one person was asking here, what was the title of the book written by the two women about the life of the Irish involving court cases? Well, this is Somerville and Ross, are their names. Uh, Edith Somerville, and I can't remember her, her um, colleague's uh, first name, but it's Somerville and Ross, names. And the series of books were called The Irish RM. Uh, they're very funny. They're, they're, they're well worth having a good read of. And it gives you a sense of what Irish society was like around 1900. We've got another uh, question here. Would the recorders' names be on any of the Petty Sessions records? Um, no, they're not. But I'll tell you where you'll find them, and they're already online, is if you go to our wonderful collection of directories, um, the Tom's directory uh, and the, the, the National Directory, Slater's directories, recorded all the Petty Sessions recorders uh, for every single district. It's quite interesting. I'm glad you actually mentioned this particular question because we have a wonderful uh, collection of pre-famine uh, records from Clare, which were uh, uh, lent to us by a good friend of ours from Clare, uh, uh, whose ancestor was a Petty Sessions clerk. She was the probably the only woman who was a Petty Sessions clerk around 1900. Uh, and she held on to these records and, and, and um, passed down through the generations. So we're, we're, we're really hoping to be able to find more early Petty Sessions records precisely because of what, what the recorders did with them. So if you know of a recorder, we'd love to actually try and track them down and see if the descendants have anything. Is there any way to get the dogs' names for Donegal? Was the question that was being asked by another by another listener. Uh, well, it really depends on the clerk who is writing the license books. Some of them, and unfortunately the minority, they wrote down the dogs' names, but most of them they didn't. The question we have here is, am I to understand there are no Northern Ireland prison records available online now? Yes, you're correct. Um, we, we, there were three or four county prisons in operation in what is now Northern Ireland. Um, and there was one in Belfast, there was one in Armagh, one in Derry. I think they were the only three in operation, but those are all in the public record office of Northern Ireland. Understandably, there's been a sort of fairly heavy security around those sorts of records uh, up until recently, but we're hoping to be able to persuade Prony to allow us to actually image these records and get them online as well. Another question here is, would there be any details of where people that died in prison were buried? Ah, interesting question. I can't actually answer it. I mean, normally speaking, somebody who died in a prison was buried in, in their own uh, uh, burial plot um, or were buried in whatever the local authorities' prison plot, no, not prison, but um, burial plot may have been. But I'm not aware of surviving records from the prisons. Um, they're certainly not available in the National Archives that I'm aware of. And also, a last question I've got here is, could you explain again the difference between the quarter sessions and petty sessions? Okay, there's a number of fundamental differences. The quarter sessions were like a county court. In fact, the county courts, both in England and in Ireland, developed out of the quarter sessions. And they dealt with criminal cases and breaches of, of statute law, uh, breaches of acts of parliament. Um, and they, uh, like, they dealt with relatively serious crimes, but not the murders, which were dealt with by the assize court. Um, the other major difference between the quarter sessions and petty sessions is the quarter sessions records generally don't survive. Um, but thankfully, their cases tend to get covered by local newspapers, so it's not such a huge loss. Petty sessions only dealt with the most minor offences uh, and most minor disputes at a local level. At a certain point, if you had a dispute over the amount of money you were supposed to get paid and you hadn't got paid, if it went over a certain figure, you had to take it out of petty sessions and, and appeal uh, your case to the quarter sessions. So it was really dealing with very low-level crime or disputes. Um, now, another question I have here, were Kilmainham Hospital and Kilmainham Jail two different facilities? Oh, very definitely two different facilities. The, uh, uh, the Royal Hospital Kilmainham was set up in the 
17th century to 1600s as a veterans hospital for the army. It still functions today, but is now the Irish Museum of Modern Art. Beautiful building, um, but it's a, it's a little bit of a ways down the road from it is Kilmainham Jail. And Kilmainham Jail was the Dublin County court, uh, Courthouse Jail. So it dealt with all the um, criminals come, or more of those convicted in the county courts in Dublin. I have another question here. Have a Daniel Kennedy army pensioner married in Rassaran in, I think it was 1850 in, in Queens County or Leash, um, and they were baptized there in 1862 before emigration to Ontario and Canada. What prison would be in the area now? What prison will be in uh, in Leash? Um, there's a prisons in, I think there's one in Mullingar, um, and I think there's also another prison uh, nearby, which would have been as Maryborough Prison would be the obvious one. Um, so yeah, have a look at Maryborough Prison, because that would be in the that would be in the county court, county prison for Leash. Now I think that's my last question for this uh, webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you didn't catch everything you want, this is going to be uh, placed in our webinar section on the Fireman Pass website, so you can come back and listen to it again. Um, thank you very much.